I met a college English instructor, I changed careers, and I worked for a really great paper that gave writers a lot of freedom. But what you looked for was something that the daily paper had messed up on. Right, the dailies are working real fast. They're, they, the dailies, unfortunately, sometimes don't think the most of their readers and think their readers can't handle something really complicated. And so you're always looking for something that they did too quickly or they didn't do fully. And one day I was looking through the Arizona Republic and there was a letter to the editor from a guy saying, yes, you wrote a story and I did lose a lawsuit, but you completely ignored the fact that it was the Church of Scientology who recruited the plaintiff. And that's irresponsible to leave that out of the story. And I was like, wow, that's a story. And the man's name was Rick Ross, and so I contacted him. He's uh, one of the most famous cult experts in the world. And uh, this was my first ever cover story, it was about how Rick, and it was not just about Scientology, it's all the groups he was involved in. And that, was, that particular lawsuit's kind of famous because Scientology had recruited a, a kid that had been in a Christian cult that Rick and his mother had held against his will, and he was 18, he was supposed to do that. And so, uh, the local police weren't going to do anything about it, but Scientology convinced the kid to sue Rick, won $5 million, and one of the other defendants was the Cult Awareness Network, because the Cult Awareness Network had referred the, uh, Rick to the mom, and it bankrupted CAN, and the Church of Scientology ended up owning the Cult Awareness Network. So then when you called up the Cult Awareness Network for cult information, you had no idea you were calling Scientology. So it's a famous case, and um, the other thing I like about that story was I, I think I'm the only reporter ever to make the Scientology David Koresh connection, which was um, all, these, all these groups hate Rick Ross, and um, Scientology apparently thought that if they could get David Koresh riled up enough, that Koresh might kill Rick. And so they had actually, when, when, when Scientology found out that Rick had deprogrammed a, a Branch Davidian, they made sure that uh, Koresh got that information. And I confirmed that with the private eye that did it. So that was a fun story. So after that, you know, um, I, the other nice thing about working for a paper like that was they encouraged you to do follow-ups and have once, you know, once you worked that hard on a story, I worked on that story for a couple of months, talked to dozens and dozens of people, that will naturally lead into another story. So then I wrote a story about a guy named Jeff Jacobson and how he had protested Scientology, and so then they came back and protested his house. That's how Scientology works. And then, uh, then I moved to LA, and uh, again, one story leads to another. I did the Tory Christmas story, which is still one of my favorite. And you know what, you're, you're in LA, you're in the belly of the beast, I and mean, it was great doing stories there. And it really confused Scientology, because what Scientology is used to is a publication doing one story about them and then leaving it alone. So like, you know, The New Yorker did the incredible Lawrence Wright story in uh, February 2011. They'll never mention the word Scientology ever again. They're done, you know. And here, this little paper that I was with had done, I had done several stories, my colleague Ron Russell had done several stories. It got to the point where they invited my publisher and my editor to lunch at the Celebrity Center to, to try to talk them out of reporting on them anymore. And at the last minute, the publisher couldn't go, and so the editor asked me to go. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, uh, the person that was gonna have lunch with her, her name was Karen Powell, and she's been a sort of a minor spokesman forever, now she's sort of been thrust into the top spot through necessity, but she really wasn't happy that I came with the editor. And we sat down, and uh, the restaurant there is fabulous, by the way. <laughs> it's on Franklin Avenue in Hollywood, and it was called the Renaissance, right? Yeah. And I still remember the sea bass and wild rice I had. It, it was that good. And it wasn't until afterwards I thought, should I have been eating a meal served by Sea Org members? But uh, I got under her skin because she was trying to quote safe point my editor and show him what a lovely thing Scientology, why are you picking on us, blah, blah, blah. And I would just sort of pick my spot. Well, so how many people are OT? You know, and she told me 10%, which I've never heard of another spokesperson ever say that. I, I thought that was an interesting figure. And um, I, I got under her skin, I, I, get, I was being a brat. And at one point I had said something about, oh, you know, you tell people that you can be a, a Jew and be a Scientologist, you can be a Catholic and be a Scientologist, but didn't, didn't L. Ron Hubbard say that Jesus was just like an implant from this ancient alien race, you know? 
and she was getting really hot at this point. And I'll never forget, she just lost it. She looked at us and she said, so what? So we think Jesus is a figment of the imagination. What does that matter? And I'm just writing down. That was her Tommy Davis moment.